heavenly heart in the head, when would it have moved in the least? Dost thou ask, can the heavenly heart not be moved? Then I answer, how could the true thought in the square inch be moved? This is deep. Welcome once again to Secret of the Golden Flower. Last time we were talking about the earthly heart, the ordinary heart here in the chest, and how it's subjective, it's dependent upon the external conditions in which it happens to be. But the heavenly heart in the square inch, the Agnya Chakra, does not have to be subject to external influence. Anyone who practices the jhanas, Buddha's meditation instructions, knows this. When you get to the higher jhanas, the so-called non-material jhanas, the first one is infinite space. Infinite. Infinite means no limits whatsoever. It just goes on and on. So everything that we know, everything that exists and has being, has a limit. If not in space, at least in time. It comes into being at a certain time and that later on it disappears. But when we have an infinite space, even the whole universe, the whole manifestation, everything that has being is nothing in comparison. It's as if the example is given. You take a glass of sugar water, huh? nice sweet sugar water, and you pour it in the ocean. Is it going to have any effect on the ocean? No. The ocean is going to stay salty no matter what. So in the same way, everything that be, no matter how amazingly huge it is, is still not infinite. It still has boundaries, it still has limits, it still has an edge. So when we cognize actually infinite space, that means whatever there is shrinks into nothingness, into insignificance. Just like this house where I am right now. It might seem nice and comfortably large. But if you go up in an airplane at 30,000 feet and fly over, it's nothing. It's just part of the texture of the ground. You wouldn't even see it as a separate thing. So in the same way, this whole universe, even though it seems very roomy <laughs> and large, is nothing. It's nothing because it's limited. Because anything that has being is going to be limited. So, in the same way, the worldly situation that we find ourselves in may seem very big and imposing. Huh? Like just today, there was a big surprise. Trump looks like he's going to win the election. Uh, in India, 
they suddenly pulled all the 500,000 rupee notes off and said, these aren't money anymore, too bad. <laughs> Surprise! Well, the world is full of surprises. But in the long run, are these really of any significance? No. No, it's just small change. Today, it's happening. Tomorrow, it's finished and something else is going on. Big deal. So, the heavenly heart, try to understand, is the root of our being. It is the origin of this body, this mind, huh? even this consciousness that we think is so impressive. It's just nothing compared to the actual origin, pure awareness, unconditioned, non-dual awareness. That's enlightenment. That's the natural condition. It's unlimited. It's infinite. So infinite space makes the whole universe seem like nothing. Infinite consciousness, meaning pure awareness, because ordinary consciousness is limited to the senses and mind. But infinite consciousness, root consciousness, is not limited and is therefore bigger than the whole creation. And you can realize this. This isn't enlightenment, but it's on the way to enlightenment. This was one of the things that Buddha learned from Alarka Kalama. And that was the state of the art in self-realization in those days. But then Buddha said, no, I feel there's something beyond this. And so he left Alarka Kalama and went to search for it. Not outside, but inside. Why did he leave then if he was searching inside? Because if you are uh, floating in a stream, then you are restricted to that stream. And wherever that stream goes is where you're going. In the same way, if you are partaking in or immersed in a particular kind of consciousness, a particular kind of view about the world, and you are in an association with other people who hold the same or similar view, then you are going to experience the consequences, the result of that view. Even though you may have reservations, you may have doubts. Oh, I think there's something more, there's something better. But because you're in that association, that's where you're going. And that's what's going to happen to you. So we have had to leave all organized religious groups because of this, because the group becomes a limited thing with its own quality, characteristics, consciousness, and destinations. And if we want a higher destination, or if we even suspect that there might be a higher destination, we have to leave and go find it. This is why the Buddha always recommended that his disciples should go out alone and meditate. You can't find anywhere in the Buddha Sutras where the Buddha says, okay, now form a group and go off and meditate. He doesn't say that. He says, go off alone and meditate. There's so many examples. And the standard phrase used to describe the attainment of arhat in the suttas is then so and so, <laughs> after hearing the Buddha's instructions, went off alone 
and in no long time had attained the result for which clansmen leave their family, blah, 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 blah. Okay? It's a stock phrase in Pali. Why? Because any time that we align ourselves or identify ourselves or uh, belong to or conceive ourselves of as sharing the energy of a group, then we are also sharing the group's thoughts, feelings, and destination. We can't go beyond it. Why? Because it has become our context. And context determines meaning. So if we put ourselves in a context that gives our existence or our being a certain meaning, we're stuck with that. To leave that, or to go beyond it, we have to go off by ourselves and create a new context, and that's what we have done. The secret of the golden flower and the community associated with it are not claimed by, are not owned by, are not invested in or controlled by any particular religious group or organization. It's a separate thing. And we're also not saying you have to all come together and live in a certain place. No. It's an online community. It's a virtual community. And as a virtual community, you have the option to, to opt out anytime. You are alone, but not independent. You're interdependent with others are thinking along the same lines. Those who are thinking along the same lines, like myself and my friends, we all want to have our private space. Nobody wants to live in a dormitory. <laughs> Nor should we have to. So try to understand, this is your community. You can structure it the way you like. Uh, we have a a Slack conversation, you know, it's an ongoing conversation. We have daily Skype meetings among the uh, most interested, most involved members of the community. And, and we're the ones who are determined what happens. It's just a small group, just a handful of people. Huh? And we are experienced, we've been through this before. We know a lot of the traps and mistakes, and we're determined not to make them again. So, the situation now has become a real emergency. And the danger is that one can get trapped by circumstances, associating with the wrong kind of people. Well, what do we mean the wrong kind of people? Well, we don't mean those of any particular religion, race, nationality, cultural, linguistic group, or whatever. What we mean is people who don't have the vision, people whose mind, whose view, does not have the space to make this whole manifestation seem like nothing. Let's go into a little metaphysics here, okay? The original consciousness in the heavenly heart is not part of the world. It is separate from the world. Why is that? It comes into being before the existence of the world. And indeed, the world that we experience is a creation of this consciousness. And the proof of that is if we change our consciousness, then our experience of the world changes at the same time. We've already given several examples. So, <laughs> if our consciousness is rooted in the circumstances of the external, then when they change, we will also change. 
But if our awareness is original, rooted in emptiness, then emptiness can never change, will never change. Emptiness is emptiness. <laughs> That's why the Buddha said, I am before and also now only giving teachings in relation with emptiness. His whole teaching was founded on emptiness. It was based on emptiness. And it was related with emptiness. Everything he says. Why does he give the kind of models that he does? Why does he give the kind of examples that he does? Only to illustrate emptiness. Any any realized master is going to be like that. Because emptiness is that which endures always. If this whole universe were to collapse, emptiness would not be affected. It wouldn't be shaken. So this original consciousness, the heavenly heart, is awareness of emptiness, or I could put it in another way, that awareness is emptiness. <laughs> That's a very wonderful thought. Awareness is emptiness. Awareness is space, isn't it? What shows up in your space when you're aware of your awareness? Consciousness. Consciousness of this, consciousness of that. Uh, this kind of consciousness, that kind of consciousness. Because consciousness has qualities. Consciousness has objects. Consciousness has forms and names and all kinds of stuff that tie it to the manifestation. If the manifestation were to go away, huh? let's say tomorrow the universe decides, okay, I'm through with this, I'm out of here, bye. <laughs> <laughs> then what? Huh? No more consciousness. But would we still have awareness? Yes. Because awareness is only the potential for consciousness. It's a space. It's an emptiness. It's a no thing. A non-being. That's why I keep telling you not to look but simply to see, to reverse the flow. Let the universe come to you. That's what Osho means when he says, you are emperors. Huh? The emperor doesn't have to go for it. He has it delivered. <laughs> so the meditator, the enlightened one, doesn't have to go out into the world for experience. He simply relaxes, lets experience come to him. Of course, that means relinquishing control. But our control is only a, our best guess anyway. Isn't it? Most of the time we actually fail at control, at prediction, at guesswork. So what really works? is when we simply put ourselves in a situation that's going to take us where we want to go. That's why we need a community, even for enlightened people. Even enlightened people, I maybe especially enlightened people, need community. It's a stream that will take you where you want to go, not where you don't want to go. That's why we create this. It's sort of like a surrogate family. You know, it's like the waters of the earth gathering together in the valley to form a stream to go seek the ocean. Wisdom seeks its own level. So far, most of us are isolated, working alone. And it's more difficult than it needs to be. Better to come together on the right principles 
in search of a community space where we can be enlightened, and not have to conform to the society, not have to be influenced by the vagarities of chance in this world. So we also have a duty to teach and to influence others. And so if we work together to teach, we can be so much more effective than if we're simply off on our own, isn't it? But we have to have a community that meets our standards. Best way to ensure that is to be involved in creating it from the beginning. So if you want to be part of this golden flower community, contact me and I'll send you an invitation. <laughs>